Okay. Um, so I'm not, I don't think I need to introduce him quite, um, a lot. He's extremely famous for his games Braid and, and The Witness, and also for his programming language in Spiel. And I'm very, very happy to host this Q&A session today. So there will be enough time, I hope, for all of you to answer your urgent questions. Um, but we will go through topic. So um, I have already some pre-sent questions, so none of those questions are mine. So if there are any stupid questions, <laughs> they're not mine. <laughs> then I throw a floppy disk yeah. at somebody. <laughs> <laughs> just, just look at someone and look really, really angry. <laughs> Could be anyone. Yeah. Um, okay, um, but then you have enough time for each topic to come up with really good questions or even more stupid questions, but my questions are looked at them. Yeah, so let's welcome Jonathan. Thank you for being here. They already welcome me. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, the first questions are um, about the game Braid. Okay. So this was your first game. Mm -hmm. um, so the, already one of the first game uh, questions was, what was before Braid? What happened before? What happened before? I, I had a whole life before that. <laughs> Tell us about your whole life. Uh, I didn't but know we were doing life questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I learned to program when I was pretty young. Like, I was 10 years old um, when I had my first computer class. And so... When I was growing up in school, I did a bunch of little games that were, were not... There was sort of thing you make when you were just learning and you don't really have any idea how to build a big thing. So none of those ever made it... Actually, one of them won in a, a text adventure contest in a magazine. In one of the magazines where they would like print the source code and stuff. Um, in like 1988 or something. 1987. Something like that. Um, I don't know. And then I went to uh, university at University of California, Berkeley, where I actually learned some computer science. Not too much, but some. And uh, after that, I started a game company in 1996. And that was the absolute worst possible time in the history of video games to try and start a game company. And despite that, we managed to last four years before shutting it down. Um, but that was when I learned to get very good at, at actually, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that. That's too strong a statement. But I got really a lot of practice at programming uh, ambitious things at a level much heightened from what you do in school because that was my first major after school thing. Then I did a bunch of contracting for various game companies in the early 2000s. And I started on Braid at the end of 2004, and that took a few years. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, so one of the typical questions you get quite often, I guess, um, and there's an entire talk about this, we know that, um, but, but people are still very interested in, in the technical aspects of the time rewind aspect of, of Braid. And not only what did you do back then to make yeah. this happen, but also how would you do it nowadays? Um, the, I think I know why this is a question. And so this is gonna become a rant about why this is a question and not about the actual, I mean, we'll, we'll get to the actual answer, uh, but I mean, let's talk about what we know about games, even if you haven't really had much practice making them, right? So games tend to display, so the graphical part, for example, tends to be displayed one frame at a time on a screen, right? So there's discrete states that must be displayed in order for you to see what's happening in the game, right? And then what, um, what do those states consist of? Well, Depends on the game, but for something like Raid, for example, there's just some different characters running around or something. And how do you make that happen? Well, you did some programming to make that happen. Like there's variables like how fast are they moving in X and how fast are they moving in Y and what's the last time this character landed from a jump, right? All those things that you program. Now, just from those statements, it should be obvious how to implement Rewind. Like, that's all you need. You just, every frame, you store 
the values of the important variables and you restore them later. Like from first principles, it really is that trivial. Okay, the problem is, and I, I lay this partly at the feet of computer science education, right? Not completely. But the, the problem is that everything is made more difficult than it needs to be. So there's some weird idea that I hope we get over eventually. But there's a very weird idea that you get more powerful as a programmer when you build abstractions on top of other things. And there's a little bit of truth to that because, uh, you know, it makes things easier to think about, right? But there's a lot of untruth to that because it makes a lot of problems harder. So if you download somebody's entity system framework that does some dynamic dispatch component-oriented messaging thing behind the scenes that you don't exactly know how it works and you don't care how it works and then you go do some little platformer characters and they run around and then it's time to rewind you'll go like well I have no idea I have no idea how to make this happen because I don't know what's going on underneath and the thing was not built to do exactly what I need to do, and therefore now I cannot do it without tearing my program down to nothing and rebuilding it, right? And that's the problem with, that's one of the problems with abstractions. There's, there's actually a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, and so we need to get over, there's some idea that as you layer more and more abstractions on, you get more and more closer to heaven or something, right? And it's really wrong. What happens is you're on top of a very unstable, shaky tower that can fall out down at any minute. So you need to be careful about what the abstractions are. Abstractions are important, but you need to make sure that they're what you need to do the job and that they don't do things that interfere with your ability to do the job, which they almost always will, and you need to go modify them and stuff. So, um, I mean, really, the other thing to say about that is I did give a lecture at GDC that goes into the details of how this is done. So if you're curious, you can probably find that uh, pretty easily. But it really should be a non-question, right? I mean, the questions are more like, well, how do you, how do you make it space efficient, right? Or how do you do it, um, how do you do things uh, so that you don't spend too much time every frame figuring out what information to record. And those are reasonable questions, but they're also, um, they're very game specific and the answer will change based on your particular game. So, uh, but I do cover that sort of thing in that talk as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, there's a sub questions like, um, what sort of like memory usage did you deal with? But I think we can refer to the GDC talk at this point. Mm -hmm. um, um, another, a couple of, um, people were also interested in like the personal relationship or personal points aspects you put into this game what sort of personal inspiration did you did you put into this game is it based on the real story what was yeah uh, it's hard to summarize that kind of a thing I mean Back when I got the idea to make this game, which was 2004, end of 2004, um, th there wasn't much of a history of people treating video games as works of art that they were trying to make, right? There's much more of that now. Um, I mean, it, which is not the same as saying that games weren't art. Like, if you go, the further back you go, especially around the 1980s, you would see all sorts of video games in the 80s that were you know, quirky expressions of things that people were interested in, right? They were, they were very personal in that way, but they still weren't really... Um... I mean, there's a thing that happens in art. Art is a funny word. It can get used all sorts of different ways, but, you know, there, there are kinds of art where somebody's just like, oh, I'm throwing some paint on a canvas and I'm making a sloppy painting and it's just my expression, man, right? And And... Those are fun, but there's also a mode where people go into where they're trying to make things that at least transcend their current moment a little bit, or they try hard to make something that contributes to the history of art or that develops um, an idea further than anybody has before, right? And those tend to be the things that people appreciate later, and that hadn't really been done in games. And one of the ways that I knew 
how to do that was to make it a little bit of a personal expression, but not, it's not a personal expression in a factual way. Like there's not much in the game that are, that consists of correct autobiographical details, right? It's not like that. It's more, um, a fantastical extrapolation of things that I deeply care about. So the things that I care about are really down, um, down at the roots of what is happening at that in that game and then um, things are built on that now it's interesting too because the next game after that the witness is also um i would say i was making art in in that design also but not by making it an intensely personal expression at all it goes in a different direction and so the games feel very different in that way but maybe I'm coming a little bit more off topic of that game now. That's fine. That's yeah. fine. I think it's fine with us. Um, but if you would publish Braid nowadays, yeah. do you think it would be as successful as it was back then? Absolutely not, no. Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, you can't say for sure because, I mean, it's a... It's a counterfactual, like, the, I don't know. Well, if we assume that things would be exactly the same now if that game hadn't existed, which might be true. Uh, yeah, it would be, it would be difficult to get attention. Um, and especially because, you know, some of the kinds of ideas, some of the kind of design exploration that was done in that game has been done by some other games afterward. And so some of the things that, if it re released now, the things it did would not be so original. They would still be their own thing and, and nice in that way, but uh, it would be less like, whoa, this is interesting and different, you know? Um, but also it's just way easier to make games than it ever has been, ever. And so there are so many more games and it's, hard to get attention for your thing whereas in you know nine years ago when that game came out it was still pretty hard to make to make things beyond a certain level um, and so there's fewer places for people to look <laughs> that's all um are there any future play plans with bright i can't say <laughs> <laughs> okay so, questions from the audience um, to the topic, the break. Thank you. Um, my curiosity is ever since I played the game, I was wondering if there's any connection between the game uh, and the book, Gödelesh of Bach, especially since I saw uh, a, a talk on YouTube where you said the game kind of uh, designed itself in a way where like you just made a system work and then explored what came out of that and that, that yeah. reinforced you more the feeling that it somehow has something to do with the book. Um, I have not read that book in a long time. So, uh, and it had even been a long time before I made that game since I read that book. Um, it is, I remember it as being a very good book and I remember it as being inspirational in a certain way. Um, I don't feel like there's a, a very direct factual connection between, you know, that book and the game, but there's maybe a, um, there is, there is a tenuous, hard to explain connection there that I can't, you know, there's just some way when you read things and they impact on you, you just take them forward and they come out in some different way. And, you know, a, a long book like that, you know, you certainly can't reproduce the book word for word from memory, or I can't, right? So, so what you take from it is not exactly the text of the book, right? It's some understanding that you got, and then you reproduce in a different ways. And so, um, there's something there. Um, it's not. I wouldn't consider it uh, one of the primary influences because those are maybe some things that I um, that I've cited more directly when talking about this before. So, uh, books like Invisible Cities from Calvino. Um, Einstein's dreams from Alan Lightman and, and so forth. But 
yeah, that book is, is in there somewhere for sure. Um, by the way, um, for the Twitch viewers, um, we are also taking questions on Twi Twitch. So if you're interested, um, just put, put a question um, into the comments. Um, hi. I just wanted to ask of all the game-related things you've done, which is one that you're the most proud of, personally? I just think of these things as differently than other people, so I'm not sure that I have a proud of. Uh, but definitely, if I translate that into my own my own thing, um, I think it's the witness. The witness is the most sophisticated thing, and the most difficult, and the most uh, far-reaching in terms of what it explores. So, uh, which is good because it took a long time. And if, if I'd worked that hard on something that ended up just being kind of mediocre, I would have been sad about it. But when it's the best thing that you've, you know, the best thing that you've made, um, that's pretty good. So, yeah. So, should we move on to the, to the witness? Sure. Um, so, you already mentioned that it's... Um, one question was definitely also, uh, it's more a personal question, um, but Braid was so successful. How much pressure was it being as successful with The Witness? This is, an, with it? this is another one of those questions that doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess a lot of people think that way. And so I have to try to bridge the gap when I'm trying to communicate about these. I mean, there's no pressure at all in the sense of following up a success, but people think that there should be for some reason, but like, I'm not. So from the outside, you look at somebody who's doing some projects and there's this tendency to think that they're doing those projects in order to have them be public successes, or mainly for that reason. Um, but that's not, that's not why I do things, and it's not why most people I know do things, right? Usually we're interested in what we're exploring. You know, we want to... The craft of games happens on many levels, so when I care about design, I'm really interested in the nuances of the design I'm exploring. I'm also thinking about what kinds of interesting experiences can I make for people? Or can, what can I show them? You know, can I make a very enjoyable thing? And then there's another level of like, man, I hope I make enough money off this to keep making games, because that's not obvious, uh, especially when you make really weird stuff like The Witness, right? Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that it's a success. Well, you know, it was, but going back in time, right? I was hoping that it was a success mainly for those kinds of reasons, right? Like I hope that I execute this game well enough that people can have, that people can see some of the things that I'm trying to show. Or I hope that I execute it well enough that I can continue to make games after this. Um, but there's really no um, worrying about what do I look like to the p mysterious, invisible people out there judging my games? And there's a bunch of reasons for that. One is that when you work that hard on something, like I worked on The Witness for seven years, and I spent a lot of time working on subtle things that I cared about a lot that a vanishingly small percentage of people who play the game will ever notice. Uh, but the important thing is because those people who do notice and understand this stuff are probably the people who are the most engaged in the game or the most interested in the game, right? And so, you know, the way I thought about it was I'm designing a very complex thing and most people will get a small bit of it and then fewer people will get more and fewer people will get more and so on, right? And the number of people who get everything is tiny, but whoever you are and whatever experience you're looking to have and whatever you're ready for in terms of, you know, like if you've been playing games for many years, you're probably ready for a less stereotypical game design than somebody who just started playing games last year, right? So whatever dimensionality shows up 
to play this game, there's some level of engagement that they can have that makes sense. Um, now I don't remember how I was going to tie that back. Oh, it's just, it's just that, um, I mean, those are the things that I'm thinking about. Uh, and, and I also know, I mean, you know, with the explosion of the internet and its popularity and social media being very popular, um, one thing that's happened is like, the official criticism of video games, like the things that people write on websites and stuff, has gotten worse than it's been. You know, there are, so, so then speaking about like, oh, what, what if critics like or don't like the game? Um, there are not very many critics who I expect to be thinking very deeply about a game in that way, you know? And that's not really any kind of bash on critics. It's just plainly true. If you go to a game website and read the kind of things that they write about games, with a few small exceptions, you know, most sites are just writing the obvious things you see in the first, you know, your first brush with the game and, and, and that's it. So, uh, you know, I mean, there, there have definitely been some, some critics in websites and on YouTube and stuff who... Uh, didn't like the game for sure, and I mostly haven't read what they had to say. But in the few cases when I did, I was like, "Yeah, this person doesn't really understand the game, so it's fine if they don't like it. It's not really for them, or they didn't, they weren't interested enough to dig into it, or something, right?" So it's that's a maybe maybe it was a simple question, and I gave a long answer, but. Um, the things that bother me are much more along the lines of what if, what if I don't succeed well enough at what I'm trying to do, right? Not what, not at what somebody over there is thinking. I, I, I was meant to be pointing at nobody in the room, right? But somebody over there, what they think really doesn't matter very much. Yeah. Um, another comment and questions. In, in, the, in the game movie, you talk about how finally releasing Brave to the public was a negative experience to you. Um, yeah, for in sure. This, in what mind did you somehow prepare for the release of The Witness in a different way, and what, which was in development for a much longer period of time as well? Yeah. Well, so actually tying into the indie game thing, it's not very obvious from that movie. Um, but when I talk about the negative experience, a significant part of the of the negativity was critics not getting the game, right? So when I talk about like people don't understand the game, I'm, I'm not really talking in that movie about the general public because I don't really have that much of a way to know what the general public thinks. But, you know, when people, there were certain people who would go, not even writing reviews, but writing articles, telling people, this is what this game is about. And they would go tell people, broadcast, back when people actually read blogs on the internet, um, like personal blogs and stuff, like these, these people would say what the game's about and it would be like, that's not at all what the, you know, and so I was very, you can feel a little bit crushed by that when you work very hard to do something and then it gets distorted in this way by people who gleefully distort it. Uh, fortunately, most of those distortions didn't survive very well. And so the understanding of the game that survives today is at least a little bit accurate, right? Um, but also there's just, um, I think it's a well understood psychological phenomenon that when you work on something hard for a long time, you're actually not happy when you're done, right? You get, it's a human thing to have a little wave of depression that comes in. Um, and then, um, well, I can just get to the subject of how I did it differently for the witness. First of all, not caring about what critics think of the game was a large component of that. Um, because I knew, you know, the people who understand the least will write the harshest and dumbest things. So just why, why read that stuff? Right. Um, now, the, which is not the same, it's not the same thing as saying that anyone who doesn't like your game is wrong, right? There will be some people who are smart and understand the game and don't like it, and, and that's fine too. But, but it, we're talking about the internet, so most people are not that, right? Most people are the other kind. Um, 
So just not caring so much about that, uh, knowing in advance that I would probably have some period of time of feeling low after the game came out and just preparing myself and understanding, okay, this is how it's going to be. So let's get ready for that. Um, and also just having had the experience before, you're just better at it the second time. So that's, it's a useful skill to build. Uh, both really, if you haven't ever shipped a large game, it's very hard to understand even the magnitude of work that goes into that. Like once, once most people would look at it and say, oh, it's done, look, it's done. It's like, no, you've got an endless list of very tiny things to do. And they get small, the more of them you do, the more, it's like playing asteroids where you shoot the asteroid and it breaks into smaller asteroids, right? So now you've got three smaller asteroids instead of one big one. And now you have to go get those and they break into even smaller. So that's exactly what shipping a game is like. So. Um, and that's part of why you get so tired at the end is because you're just doing this endless list of things. Um, but once you've done it before and you're prepared, then you at least know, yep, this is, I'm just doing this thing again. And something, something deeper in your mind is more likely to say, I understand that this will be rewarding later because, um, because I've seen this before, and then I've seen, I've seen that it doesn't last forever, so this time won't last forever either. Yeah, but that's a, that's not a logical thing. That's a, it's a sub. There are sub rational operations of your mind that you need to deal with if you're going to do hard projects, because those are the things that'll. If you don't deal with them, they will make you want to quit or give up or just make you, uh, you know, have negative emotion for no reason and things like that. So when was the, when was the point when you finally decided, okay, that's it. I'm going to release the witness now. Well, so the witness, we did what I normally would not do. Uh, and we announced the release date before we had done everything that was important. Um, so it was, it was probably August or September, probably September of 2015. And we said, January 2016 is the release, which is only four months away, um, which is, it's a smart thing to do if you want people to pay attention to the game, because now they know when to look for it. Um, it's a little bit of a problem if you're not sure that you're going to get everything done. And we didn't quite get everything done. Um, you know, the release date is, is not when you have to be done with the game, right? It, this is still changing over time, but especially if you're launching on a console, you probably need to be done with everything about a month before. And uh, certain classes of changes are easier to make very late and certain other ones aren't. So we had to go into certification on the PlayStation 4 before the game was done. I don't want to spoil anything, but there's, uh, you know, there are videos in the game and there's a live action video that we hadn't filmed yet when we submitted our game. And it's important because you get to that in, after doing a lot of difficult things. So we submitted the game to Sony and we patched that in like two days before release. And we filmed it like the day before we patched it in. <laughs> it was, it was really close. Yeah. Oh, there's already a question on that. Okay, okay. Yeah, how did you... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how were you able to release this without a rating or anything? Did you just write to them the content of what the video would be? or? Without? No, we had to get it rated for certain platforms. Oh, yeah, okay. it depends. So on Steam, for example, it's all up to the publisher. So Steam doesn't care if your game is rated, right? Uh, iOS... They have their own ratings that they do or something. I don't know exactly, um, but it's not the same thing. But uh, consoles use this older system, right, where around the world there are ratings boards and you have to submit your thing to them, and it's very annoying. Um, but usually the way that works is you submit some documentation to them. Say, you read their guidelines about this is what we're going to be worried about, and you write some paragraphs explaining 
where your game has those things in it, and then you show them some video, and then they assign you a rating. And you usually have to do that a little while before uh, before you come out. Um, so we did that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we didn't ever submit to an Austria-specific ratings board. There's the one. There's one for Europe generally. Um, so we did the we did the Peggy ratings. I don't know if they use those here. Um, it's annoying, and I don't think it helps anything, but you have to do it, so we did it. Are there any more questions from the audience? Since Lorenz is already <laughs> up and running. Um, when designing the difficulty of puzzles, mm -hmm. did you have anything in mind? Like, for example, the red door puzzle in the ship is way too difficult for 99% of people. Yep. Did you intentionally do it, or was it just...? Well, I always have an idea in my mind about how difficult I think a puzzle is, right? Um, and what I find is it's generally accurate when you talk about people... Like, if you do some statistical summary, right, then my idea of how hard it is will correlate, right? But then if you just sit individual people down and watch them play, they're good at different things, right? So some people will find some puzzles very easy and other puzzles hard, and then a different person will have the opposite. And so there's no such thing as exactly how difficult a puzzle is anyway. So I think the best you could have as a designer is some general idea, right? Um, and there's especially no such thing because, you know, if the person got up that morning and they were a little bit tired, certain classes of things will be harder to do and others will not. So there's that. Um, and then when, when it came to a game like The Witness, um, my goal was to let there be really hard puzzles because part of what I was reacting to was the general course of games, let's say from the 1980s until until like lately, the past couple of years, um, especially with regard to puzzles, was that they puzzles would get easier and then get written out of games until they're like non-puzzles. Because, you know, there used to be genres of games that were only puzzle. There would be like text adventures and then graphical point and click adventures. And then those sort of died out because nobody was buying them. Um, and so then puzzles started showing up in like action games. So like Tomb Raider, the original Tomb Raider games would have puzzles in them or like God of War would have like puzzles in it. And, but they were stupid because, you know, first of all, they're not being designed by people who are thinking really hard about puzzles all the time. So they're not gonna be that good. And then secondly, they're not what you signed up to play anyway, right? It's just like, this is a thing that the designer put in to give me variety between the last combat encounter and the next combat encounter. Now I'm in a cave, I just beat up some monsters and now I have to figure out, there's something in God of War about like dragging a mine cart like onto a button. Like I don't even remember what it was, but it was, it was dumb, right? And then, and that's a puzzle, right? And the, because those aren't what the game is about, what happened is all these large game development companies bring people in and they play the early version of the game and they get comments back and all the people say, oh, this puzzle was stupid, I got stuck on it. And, and then they make it easier and make it easier. And that's been the whole course of game design. And so there kind of aren't real puzzles in games that are not explicitly puzzle games anymore. Um, but again, part of that also is because games were so linear. And the reason why I said maybe this is changing lately is because now we have a lot more open world games. And in an open world, you can just put something somewhere and if people don't figure it out, they're not stuck on it, right? If you're playing God of War, I don't know about the new one, but the old ones uh, were all linear. So if you're stuck halfway through the game on a puzzle, you just can't play the rest of the game. So they can't make them. So the way I think about puzzles is a real puzzle is something you may not ever figure out, right? If you're guaranteed to figure it out, it's not a puzzle. It's just a delaying tactic. So... So you can see why a linear game would eschew real puzzles, and almost all games were linear like that. So uh, one thing I was keenly aware of was, okay, if we design this world so that you can go lots of places, 
and lots of places are open to you at all times, then puzzles can be very difficult. And because they can be difficult or because they could, there's a whole other discussion I'm not gonna go into. Uh, <laughs> we'll just leave it there. We'll leave it there. More questions from the audience? I just, I'm, I'm conscious of time. There's a whole other 10 minutes I could have gone into off that and I just don't want to use the whole hour on one, on one answer. Are there questions on Twitch, by the way? Yeah. No. Oh, actually, there's, there is one more thing I want to say about the hard puzzles. <laughs> and this is more applicable to games generally. Is, and it's applicable to the design of the witness generally. Is... I think to be a strong designer, you have to not be afraid that people will have a bad experience with something you did, right? So, it, you know, if you make a hard puzzle and somebody goes up to it, even if they play it the way it's intended, they might still get stuck and frustrated for a long time and be mad and say, oh, I hate this game and walk away, right? But then, you know, with a game like The Witness, you know, even though early on we tried to make it so that people wouldn't just try to brute force guess all the puzzles and stuff, some people are just going to sit down and do that, and they're going to have the worst time. And they're not playing it right, but if we very heavy-handedly get them to play it right with a Nintendo-style tutorial at the beginning, that actually kills the game because the game's about nonverbal and subtle communication. So we can't do that, right? And so for that game to work, it requires understanding that some people are just going to have a bad time, right? And that's fine. We're not trying to make the best thing for everybody. And because we're not trying to make the best thing for everybody, we can then go deep in certain areas. And I think a lot of designers shoot themselves in the foot that way. Or they're not allowed. I mean, if you work for Electronic Arts, you're not allowed to say, ah, some people just aren't going to like this game, right? I mean, everybody has to like it because the budget is so high. So that's a thing. Um, but I think there is a sense of when you're doing strong work and, and when you're doing weak work. And if you develop that sense, you will know when you're making your game weak and you will not feel good about it, right? So there's something there to think about. All right. So yeah. what were the biggest challenges when, uh, ship, when you shipped the game to witness from the consoles to the mobile? Oh, yeah. <laughs> from any aspect from the I mean, it's really hard and annoying. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of very platform-specific things I could get into. There's still stuff we're trying to fix that shouldn't have been a problem. Um, Every platform has things like that where, like, if they had just done it the right way, you would have had to do 10 times less work. But really, um, really the biggest thing was just that mobile devices, uh, they're much lower powered computers, right? And so uh, we had to redo a lot of the things in the world. We had to do lower poly versions of most things. And we knew that going in. This was always the plan. But then it just turns out to be a lot of work, you know? And the thing about The Witness is um, it's a way harder game to make in certain ways than most games because the exact visuals determine the gameplay, right? They determine whether certain puzzles are solvable and they determine, uh, well, m much harder to test things like how difficult is it to understand this puzzle that I'm looking at, right? So. You know, if you change the color of one thing in the wrong way, you break the game. If you accidentally make the branch of one tree a little too long and you don't check that this other thing is visible from this other position that's not even close to that tree, then you break the game. So it was much harder than most games would have been. Um, but we did it, you know, uh, so we already had to do... Uh, asset streaming for the consoles. So as you walk around the world, not everything is loaded. Um, we have lower, you know, we have two stages of, of detail for the geometry. There's one, so an individual entity will have a mesh that could be quite detailed, tens of thousands of triangles. I don't think we have any that are in the hundreds of thousands. 
Um, a whole building might be three or 400,000, but it's usually broken into pieces. Uh, those will have one level of detail that's simplified that we use in the moderate distance. And then in the very far distance, we bake everything down into, you know, what we call them clusters. Pe different people have different terms for this, but a cluster is a whole bunch of meshes piled into one thing and with the texture maps baked out into vertex color because um, you can't switch texture maps all the time because that's too many draw calls, right? So the goal is to get rid of, get rid of the number of batches that you're sending to the GPU. So we put everything into one thing and also with, uh, with world shadow maps also baked in. So we sort of rely on the fact that it's not a very dynamic game with things moving around all the time. So, you know, obviously if you walk around in the near and you look at the ground near you, your shadow is moving and the shadow of objects near you are moving, but something, it's probably pretty close, like 20 meters away, shadows freeze and stop moving, but you hopefully don't ever notice that because not that much stuff moves and no puzzle relies on that, right? And so beyond that, the shadow is baked and it's a, it's a texture map uh, most of the time, or, you know, it's with, with a depth component, right? Um, and then in the very far distance, we actually bake that into vertex color again, so that we don't, uh, well, it would be, it would just be too slow to pull all those pixels in on the GPU all the time, I think. Um, so, so we already had that system basically, but then making it run on a lower end platform is like all your budgets for all those things, like how much can I stream in per second and what can the polygon counts be and all that are much lower. Um, and then the controls, cause we didn't, the easy way out would have been virtual joysticks and I don't like those. Um, so we put a great deal of work into having pathfinding work all over the island, despite the fact that, you know, it can't be completely statically pre-computed because we have all these dynamically moving things that connect areas or disconnect areas and stuff. And so uh, Andy, one of the guys on the team, just did a bunch of work to make that work. Um, and I, I'm happy with the controls. We did get some comments of people wanting virtual joysticks, which that feels like some kind of Stockholm syndrome to me where uh, <laughs> people just want what they know or something. Um, actually, we also, we had a bug when we shipped on on iPhone 8 and maybe 7, we ran too fast because we weren't frame locking correctly, but we didn't know that because it didn't happen during testing for some reason. And so the sidestepping motion is like two fingers to sidestep, didn't work correctly. And so people thought they couldn't sidestep for the first few days. And then, then the controls would be much more frustrating. Um, so that might be why people ask for virtual joysticks. I don't know. Was it worth it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably it was worth it, but um, it is. It, it was definitely an interesting thing to do in terms of, hey, we did this hard thing, and we, we, I did this very interesting design thing, which is just for a month or two, work hard on how do we make this playable in the best way. That's just a very interesting thing to do to develop design skills. Um, but there's always an opportunity cost, right? Well, if we just hadn't done the iOS version of the game, we could have been working on the next game sooner. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, you know, money-wise, it probably works out that we made money off it. Um, but, uh, and I think, I think everybody feels like they worked on interesting things. Um, we might be right now just a little bit because we released this a m little more than a month ago we might be still in that period of just feeling really worn down from releasing it and then you know you feel a little more negative about it but then in a couple of months everybody will be like yeah we're glad we did that um, we'll ask you next year yeah <laughs> okay um, um a couple of questions from from twitch as well uh, yeah, yeah. Um, can you can you come with the mic oh there's another question over there okay just Oh no, okay. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. <laughs> We're only in like question number five. Page for Siri. Yeah. So my turn or Twitch or? Uh, no, it's your turn. My turn. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm pretty interested in, uh, I, I try not to spoil the witness. Um, 
But my favorite part is where you have this, uh, it's called an aha moment. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, sure. if that's, uh, okay. If you um, mean the basic thing of that, not any specific? Um, let's call it when you start to think outside of the box. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, how, uh, like, when, when did you came up with this idea? I mean, like, uh, as far as I know, you, you said, like, okay, um, you make the, the, the mechanic. And then you doodled around. I think in the witness you said you doodled around and, and looked what it was possible. But that's not something I would come yeah. up when I'm doodling or something. No, that, that specific thing was the first idea of the game, actually. And then the rest of the game was, how do I build something that could plausibly lead to that? Right? And then it's, oh, okay, so we're, we're doing puzzles on little panels or something. Okay. And, and then that exploration starts where I'm seeing what's possible, right? But that, that had to, the idea to explore that specific space had to come from somewhere, right? It always has to come from somewhere. And so uh, I may have said this before in, in more detail, but basically I had a previous game that I was working on that was about casting spells by drawing lines. Um, kind of like really old games like black and white or something, but doing a better job at the spell stuff. Um, and just for various reasons, I didn't think that game was going to work. But then the surprise that you're talking about was from that game. But it was not a very central part of the game. It was just going to be a cool thing in the game. But the thing that Braid taught me is it's often very good to just take the cool part and focus on that and get rid of the other stuff because the other stuff is in every game, right? <laughs> like, if your idea of the game is, we're gonna do some stuff that's like in every game and then we'll add this cool part, then that's all right, but you could also, if you get rid of the thing that everybody else has, then you have more space for the cool part and it can grow, right? And so that's how Braid went, and I said, let's try that again. <laughs> um, so then it was designing a whole game around that, and that's probably the only reason why it works as well as it does, is because it was the priority, and everything, so, um, I mean, most people probably, because we're not spoiling things, I won't, I won't say too much in detail, but there are things about the basic art style that, that are determined by that and that made our job a lot harder. So there's certain basic shapes that occur in nature very frequently that we were not allowed to use in anything in the world unless it had meaning. Right? Because those are the things you look for once you know what you're looking for. Um, and that was hard. <laughs> uh, and, and we're all happy we don't have to do that on another game. But you know, if a game had that idea later, that wouldn't be as built into the, the basics of it. And they probably wouldn't do as clean of a job making it work. So, yeah. Which question? Could you, uh, squeeze the question on myself as well? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, to question. Uh, yeah, this is probably going to be a, a short technical question. Uh, okay. It doesn't count as a spoiler, but there's this one yeah. section where you get to look into a living room. Okay. And I was wondering, did you implement the full blown light field render over that, or was no. it restricted enough that it could just switch along the axis? Right? No, that's just a movie um, that is shot with a um, with a fisheye lens, and you get a wide enough fisheye lens. If, if you assume that the scene doesn't animate, right? Because you're walking through a static environment. So you get a fisheye lens, and then, then the pixels in your film are essentially ray casts out to different points in the environment at different depths, right? And then to reproduce that scene, you just say, okay, what's, what's the direction for this pixel that we're rendering in the scene? And then you use that direction to index into the map, which is a very simple equation. Like, I think you just take the cosine of something and you're done, or sine of something. It's very, very simple. Um, and that works because you can't actually go into that space. And uh, in, in fact, you're, you're, you're outside a window looking in, and that's why that works. We didn't do any, there's no geometry in there at all. Yeah. Twitch questions. <laughs> Okay, so because of time constraints, I will combine the most common questions <laughs> with one big question. For okay. You for that. So 
So uh, people are asking, um, how do you manage your time when working on several big projects at once? Um, are there any news about your programming language? And who's your favorite game dev that's not yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's, those questions are not that related. Uh, <laughs> I, the one about managing time is a little weird because, because I think of managing your time as determining how much you can do. Like how much of your time a day are you spending efficiently getting things done? Something like that which doesn't really have anything to do with whether there's multiple projects you're working on or not. If you're, if you're doing multiple things, then maybe you need to make more sure that you're being efficient in order to make enough progress on both of them that it wasn't a stupid idea to work on both of them. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I just, I'm very interested in what I'm doing and I want to work on it. And I don't, you know, I, I don't make as part of my habits having a web browser open and reading gaming news sites or something or, or hacker news or whatever. Like, uh, if I do go to those sites, then it's, it's when I'm not trying to work or, or even if I do, I know that I'm kind of filling my head with junk information anyway and I probably shouldn't be doing it at any time, right? I could spend that time much more productively. Um, not even, and I don't mean productively by working, but if you watch a good movie instead of reading bad websites for an hour and a half, that's probably a lot better, right? You probably uh, get more out of it as a human being in the long term. And so I'm a little bit worried about that, that so many people spend so much time in front of junk information like that, and that it becomes a little bit of a compulsion where they'll stop working at the drop of a hat to just go go to this thing, the only purpose of which is to occupy their time and, and make them not be doing the thing that they know they should be doing. So I just try to be very aware about that. Uh, some days I uh, still uh, get distracted like that, but not, not too many. So that was question number one. It was um, one big question, so that's a sub question. The next one. There was there was a fam was the favorite question? designer. The second one was one the. News about your programming language. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, we're we haven't been doing anything too newsworthy lately because it's mostly like been bug fixing and consolidating. But I want to in about a month or less. Uh, have a new demo with a new big feature, and then we're working toward. We're officially working toward. A limited beta release, but I don't have a date for that because uh, we're just fixing all the problems. Um, and then favorite designer is hard. I don't know if I have a specific favorite right now, but I can name some things that I was really impressed by lately. Um, so there's two games. They're both puzzle games for some reason. Um, but again, I, I've been talking about this game all the time, but there's a game called Steven Sausage Roll by Stephen Lavelle, which is possibly the best puzzle game ever made. And it came out last year and not very many people have played it. So if you really want to see some really good design that is of a completely different caliber than most game designers are able to do, then you play that game and understand what it's doing because um, you won't see that very often. And if you want to learn how to design games well, then I think you probably want to be paying attention to things by the really good designers and not the things that have the highest budgets, right? Because those are usually not well designed, frankly. Uh, well, they usually have some instances of good, of good design and then some instances of bad design that tend to ruin things. Um, so that was really good. Um, more recently, I was playing Opus Magnum from Zachtronics, which is um, uh, you know, it's a puzzle game. It's it's sort of about putting molecules together, um, but uh, it does an, a really amazing job of.
creating um, a longer term set of things to understand. So there'll be a puzzle pose, like make this specific molecule, and you make that molecule, and your first attempt at it is not particularly very good, and then you can tweak it because it's, it's, it's like a graphical version of programming. So you mess around with the instructions, and you make it better, and you change your design, and you make it better. And then at some point, you realize something fundamental about how this can be better, usually because somebody else on your friends list has a better score than you. And you're like, oh, how did, how did they possibly do that? And then you come to realize something about the system. And there's a beauty there uh, that you don't see very often. Um, and I'm, I, it's an interesting thing because I'm not sure that I could do it if I were designing the same game. And anytime you see that, you want to, or I could do it now, now that I've seen it, I could do it. Um, maybe I could have done it before, but I'm not 100% sure. And so anytime you see that, you like pay attention. You're like, oh yeah, that was good. That was good. Um, so I recommend that game as well. Very good. Yeah. More questions from the audience. Yeah, your your point from before actually. Um, I'm a game designer, but I honestly like with every passing year I realize that I'm bad at what I'm doing basically. You're like. <laughs> Are you a free-to-play game designer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was. Okay. For a while and I hated it. And okay. I, that's, uh, the thing is, um, my question would have been, what is a good game designer, and what is that even about? Because I think when you mentioned it before, you weren't. If you were talking to like anyone, like ninety-five percent of other designers in the industry, like myself. Yeah. They would not agree that that's a good design. They would think that a good designer is one who makes a product that sells and that monetizes people and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, here's the thing: is we're using we're using the same term to refer to two completely different pursuits, right? Um, and I'm not sure. I, I don't know. So the kind of game designer, that kind of game designer, is someone who's doing a form of industrial design that's about making the most effective product, where effective is measured by some kind of continuously computed metric that's either about, you know, m either money directly coming in or like how long people spend in front of the game or how long the average session time is or whether they continue to pay after they first paid, or what, there's all kinds of metrics like that, right? And, and for that kind of designer, the job description is exactly that you do whatever it takes to optimize those numbers, right? And a good designer would be someone who has the best ideas about, with minimal, uh, with minimal confusion and with minimal trying a bunch of random things, goes directly to something that's effective, right? Uh, that's not what I do, and it's, it's, it's in fact very, very different from what I do. Um, what I do also has an element of industrial design, and that element also overlaps with that kind. So there's a certain thing that's in common having to do with like the feel of the game, for example, right? Does it, does it respond solidly when the controls are used or something, right? And how do we, you know, do we effectively communicate gameplay state changes with visuals and things? Those tend to be things that both kinds of game designers know about. The reason they're known about on that end is because they're effective parts of the craft that actually make people more engaged in the game. The reason they care, they're cared about by people on my end is, well, the most common reason is because there's just a feeling of the right making of things. Like I did a good job on this and, and that's why I want it to respond the right way at the right time and stuff. Uh, and then there's a, a maybe a somewhat deeper reason which less designers think about, but it's because the better of a job that I do on these surface craft things, um, the less gets in the way of the subtler things that I'm trying to do deeper in the design. Like people, you know, if somebody's derailed because they can't make their character go the right way all the time, 
they're not in a very subtle place to like notice something highly interesting that's not put directly in their face. So, so f the more uh, the more delicate your design is, the better those craft components have to be actually. So that's in common. But then most of what I spend my time thinking about is completely different from that kind of game designer, right? Um, you know, I think about, am I thoroughly exploring the possibility space uh, that I'm in, right? And they couldn't care less about that, right? They, you say that in a, in a meeting at like Zynga and they kick you out of, they fire you right there probably. I don't know, but probably. Um, and I, I care about, I mean, for me, for my kind of designer, you have to be intrinsically motivated, right? Like it's, I'm making these games because I care actually very deeply about what they are and what they do. And um, every person is gonna have a different way of caring and a slightly different thing that they care about. And so then that manifests differently in what they make. So beyond that, the answer has to be different for every individual person, but it's a lot more like art at that point, right? So what I do is, has a component of art and a component of craft and industrial design, and I try to make it all work together. And then because I, you know, because you kind of have to run an independent development company if you want to do your own thing, <laughs> then there's also a component of business in there as well. Um, but it happens at a different level. So I, I, it, it's confusing because it's the same name for totally different things. So I don't know, in school, if they teach game design, I don't know what they actually teach, but, um, you know. And it's actually, and, and let me go back a second and talk about like the Zynga style metrics because the problem is not exactly having that information. Right. The problem is how you use the information. Um, information is usually good unless you just become overly obsessed with it and ignore the other things. Right. But the problem comes when it's just this is causing me to have a relationship with the players that is only viewing them as a resource that I'm extracting their money or now even more dangerously their attention from. Right. Um, that's a bad place to go. Uh, and the metrics are necessary to go there, but you don't have to go there just because you're collecting information. In fact, everybody collects information to some degree. So when I was working on The Witness, I didn't ever gather that kind of thing. And in fact, not that many people played it before it came out. But I did on a couple of occasions do things where people would just sit down and play the game. And I wanted to see, I was watching them, you know, usually not over their shoulder, but just back somewhere. And I wanted to see if what they were doing bore any resemblance to what I was designing, right? And fortunately, it usually came out that that was true. Um, so that's like a very loose kind of metric, and I, I don't even tend to do that that much, but I do it, and it's on that continuum, right? You could be somewhere where you're collecting very detailed ideas about, like, how often do people log in and stuff, and maybe you could be using that not to try to maximize those numbers. Maybe you could be using it just to say, well, if people aren't staying very long, maybe it's a sign that something in the game isn't working and I could go find that, but maybe you find it a different way than just trying to optimize your customer resource, you know. Uh, but that is harder, I think, than just doing whatever you can do to make the numbers go up. So people will often do the easier thing instead of the hard thing. So... <laughs> Is it fine for you to take a couple more questions? Yeah, I mean, I can go for quite a while yet. It's all, it's all down to whether anyone wants to stay past a certain point. <laughs> oh, many, many hands, no. Okay. Just, just saying, um, he just came from Seattle and is still probably in a different time zone. So Definitely. Really thanks for, for being with us and yeah. staying with us. <laughs> I'm still awake. That's yeah. good. necessarily a bad thing uh, and in games that's usually a technological limitation mm -hmm. uh, but 
but you kind of seem to abolish those limitations by not using a game engine, starting code from ground up, using shell, whatever, and now even doing your own programming language. So you're yeah. more the uh, kind of reinventing the wheel guy, I guess. <laughs> so my question is, what is your take on that? Let me talk about reinventing the wheel for a second. <laughs> Is that is that also in in German? Is that a phrase as well, or is it just an English yeah. thing? Okay, because yeah. this phrase really bothers me <laughs> um, because it doesn't make any sense. So it would make sense if you thought there was no such thing as a wheel, right? And then you made something, and you're like, oh, it's round, it rolls, and you were just like ignorant that everybody else is using wheels, right? Which I think when that phrase was coined is what it meant, right? But the way it's used today, it means something different. Right. So, for example, people will say, there's so many programming languages out there. Why are you making your own? Why are you reinventing the wheel? Isn't that stupid? And I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. So, you know, when you get on the train, does the train use bicycle wheels? And if it did, would it get very far? Right. Um, you know, does does your car use the same wheels that are on that push cart right there? It really doesn't. And you better be glad that it doesn't. Um, because they're doing very different jobs and they have very different engineering constraints, right? And so the funny thing is, if you go to an engineering school or a computer science school or something, you very deeply at some point, unless you slept through all your classes, you understand engineering constraints by some point, right? But somehow that phrase survives in this way that it's being used incorrectly. Uh, like as if there's no such, as if there's no reason to build a custom design for a new purpose. It's actually, it's actually a deeply dystopian view. There's some kind of view that like, what, what people are really saying when they say that is, how do you believe you can possibly do anything useful that people haven't already done? And that is a deeply negative view. If people have that kind of a viewpoint, first of all, they're unlikely to be the people who do the new and interesting things. And secondly, I, I just kind of have to wonder <laughs> what they're thinking from day to day. No offense to anybody who says that all the time, but I just, I don't understand it. Um, so there's that. Um, right. I, I'm not sure that I agree. You know, it's, it's also a, It's also a catchphrase that good art is born from limitations and whatever. And I'm not sure, I mean, I don't have as much of a problem with that because I don't think it's straight up false, but I, I don't know that limitations are as valuable. I think it's one way to make good art is to deal with limitations, but I don't think it's completely necessary. It's just easier maybe or something. Um, or you have an excuse for why you couldn't do a certain thing because I just couldn't do it. What? It's not my problem. Um, but that's also not, well, I mean, the kind of limitations that I'm trying to get around when it comes to, for example, building another programming language are not really that kind of limitation. They're the completely bad kind. Like, look, it just takes my program a lot longer to compile than it should. Uh, you know, um, like if you use, I don't know what people use here, but if you use GCC or like, Visual Studio or Clang or something. I don't know if people program in C++ anymore, but uh, most people in the game industry do. So if you use one of those things and you're compiling a program and it takes like 10 minutes or five minutes or even one minute, that's actually inexcusably slow because we all have giant, tremendous supercomputers in our pockets actually, right? Like your phone is faster than anything I ever had when I was in school by like a hundred or a thousand, I don't even, I, I did the numbers for a speech once and I don't remember what they are now, but it's a lot. And yet we don't seem to be able to do very much with that. And why? And isn't that a big problem by itself? And if you just look at, okay, you're going to compile your thing a hundred times a day. How long does it take? Let's say it's only a minute. That's a hundred minutes a day, right? That's almost, we'll round it up to two hours because you're not going to be completely, you're going to go read a web page or something and come back when it's done compiling um, or send an email. If you could save two hours a day for every programmer, like that's tremendous. That's just straight up an enormous engineering win. And so it's things like that, that, that I'm working on, right? 
And even, even if you could only save five minutes a day for every programmer, that's a lot. Five minutes a day for one person for a year is a lot of time. So. Are there more questions on Twitch as well? Uh, not right now, no. They're actually discussing what you said. Asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so we're sitting at a university here. I wonder, do you think that the education system is kind of broken in the sense uh, that yeah. it, may not, <laughs> it may not prepare people for the brutality of the real world, specifically in game development? Well, uh, so... No pressure, but... Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> Part of the problem is I don't really know what the education system is like in Austria or in Western Europe at all. So I can't really say anything appropriate to that. Um, and, you know, when I was in college in the U.S., there was no such thing as a game class of any kind, much less a program that ostensibly would teach you to make games. That's a very new thing. Um, I do think that most of the such programs that I've seen in the U.S., because I've visited a bunch, um, most of them are pretty bad, honestly. Um, there's a few that are good, but they're not good. In the, the good ones still don't prepare you for what you really need to do a good job. Um, they, just, they just teach better things and they do a better job of teaching and, and so forth. And, you know, often there's a mixture. So often they'll be like, you know, there's a program at some school and it's really kind of bad, but there's a couple of professors there who are really good. And so that time that you had with them is very valuable and then the rest of it, eh. Um, so I can just hope that it gets better over time over there. I don't know what it's like over here at all. Um, so I can't say. Um, I'm also not sure that that's the job of the university as well, right? I mean, certainly, if you're learning computer science, then, and how it's applicable to games, like with a game emphasis of computer science or something, then you want to be learning things that are science, right? And whereas if you go somewhere like Electronic Arts or Activision or Ubisoft, um, they will be very happy for you to know some of those things. But also many of them don't have immediate practical application yet. Maybe maybe somebody has yet to discover that, and that would be a very important thing to do. Um, but really, most of what you need to do day to day does not involve any kind of smart computer science-y thing, like at all, honestly. Um, but a funny thing happens where the deeper your knowledge is of computers, the better you do with that other stuff anyway, you know? Um, maybe because you understand what computers should be able to do or you understand when something is dumb. I mean, you know, like this thing, this thing is taking 30 seconds to sort a thousand items. Like what is, that doesn't make sense, right? What is happening there? Um, so, so the knowledge is, is valuable even if it is not directly applicable. And in fact, the people who push things forward have to be the people who do the things outside of what is already being done. That said, uh, I mean, I learned most of what I needed to learn by going off on my own and doing that stuff, but I probably wouldn't have done as well if I hadn't done a computer science degree. Although, <laughs> I mean, there's always, there's always opportunity costs, right? Like, so I went to University of California at Berkeley for like four and a half years or something. And, you know, maybe I could have condensed the really good part into two years or less. Um, and while I was doing all that, John Carmack, who didn't go to college as far as I know, was off making the games that led up to Doom and then Doom and, and working very rapidly. And he was doing all that stuff while I was spending time in school and thus not doing that stuff. So I don't think I would have been in exactly the same position as him to do the same thing, but I can see the analogy of like, I could have been doing that kind of thing instead of this kind of thing. And some people did okay with that, but then some people don't. So I don't know. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the witness. Yeah. 
because uh, what I don't like in games is playing through extensive tutorials that I end up skipping. Sure. And then getting lost in the five minutes, in the first five minutes of the game. And so what I really like about the witness is that it's that you learn the mechanics uh, mechanics while playing the game. So my question is, why are not more games doing it like this? Um, is it because they are too complex? There, there's a few things. Um, so one, so everything I'm about to say um, mostly only applies to Western games. Um, I tend to not like certain classes of, let's say, for example, games from Japan because they're so heavy about tutorialization, right? So anything that Nintendo releases will just beat you into the ground with messages treating you like you're dumb. And that's, even though they lightened up on that in the new Zelda game, they still do it. Right, way too much. Um, but there is also a cultural difference between what a Japanese person expects when they sit down in front of a game and, and what an American person expects. And there's something about that difference that there's some kind of formality that involves showing you the character, which I think is why Japanese games tend to be more often third person, although third person is bigger in the West now too because you can see the character and that's part of what the developers are doing is presenting the characters to you. And there's something about um, presenting the gameplay to you. And, and so the tutorialism in, in that Eastern context is partially a presentation and not just getting you to know how to play the game, right? That said, it still drives me nuts, right? And I don't like it. Um, for, for Western games, um, I think it's in part people are afraid that you'll have a bad time, right? And it's in part uh, what happens at bigger game companies. You know, they go and they focus test the game and anything people complains about gets that gets put on somebody's to-do list to go fix. And if somebody didn't know what button to press to activate the thingy, whatever it is, right? There's multiple things you could do. One is you could redesign the game to not require that. That's hard and you may not be successful. So it has an unknown amount of schedule and uh, people are probably too busy anyway, right? Um, the easy thing to do is to put in something that explicitly tells you five times how to do that. And then nobody will Hope fewer people will be confused. Some people will still just be clicking through all the stuff and not read it, like me, right? Um, but you can still then check that off your list and go on to the next things. And that kind of list-driven uh, work is very dangerous for that reason because it produces things that are worse. But it's also a fun one of the fundamental ways that you have of organizing a large team. So you maybe also don't have a choice. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't like it. And, you know, some games do less of that. And in fact, some Japanese do, games do less of that. So like the games like Dark Souls kind of things are not only um, hard, but they also tutorialize less, which is good. And I think maybe they feel free to tutorialize less because they're supposed to be hard, right? And that gives them the legitimate excuse to not be explaining things to you all the time. Um, and those are not the only examples, and there, there's certainly many in, in the West as well. But I always, um, I want a game to treat me like I am an intelligent person, and that I have some resourcefulness, and that I, I can solve problems. And that's how I like to treat people when I make games. And I was so fed up with tutorials that that's how it comes out. I mean, and Braid as well has... The, the tutorials in Braid are, there's one level where there's a couple of bitmaps in the background that tell you the controls, right? There's no interactivity to it at all. And um, yeah, so I try to keep it minimal generally. Sorry, may I quickly squeeze in myself? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if I remember correctly, in some of the puzzles in The Witness, when you messed it up, it shut off and you have to go back and redo the previous one. Yes. Something that didn't happen. Yes. When was that? Because I felt like it was punished for experiment. You were. <laughs> <laughs>
So basically, so there's, a, there's a basic design problem that you have, which is you want to let people, and this is true for all puzzle kind of games. You want to let people experiment and explore, but if they solve a puzzle, you want it to not be by accident, right? You want them to really have understood what they were doing. And um, for some puzzles, naturally, when you first design them, it's just too hard to guess. Other kinds of puzzles are much easier to guess. So for example, in The Witness, there's some apple tree kind of places and there's some panels there. And those are some of the first ones, I think, that shut off explicitly, although they're in other places too. And there's only like 12 or 14 options. So if you just wanted to win that sequence, you could just try all 12, go on to the next one, try all 12. And not only would you not understand the puzzle, but you'd be missing something very important about the game. And so uh, both for that reason and in order to communicate early that this is not really a game where you're supposed to be guessing. Because some puzzle games you maybe are supposed to guess a little bit, but in this one you're really not. Um, then I do this, this measure of, you know, what happens is you guess it wrong in this electronic panel that you're trying to use shuts off and you have to the first time figure out even that you can go back to the previous one and resolve it, right? But then once you figure that out, there's now this friction involved in a negative uh, experiment, right? Um, but you don't know when it applies and when it doesn't as well. Um, and I, I wouldn't exactly say that that's the most elegant solution ever. Um, but it was n necessary and it was the most minimal solution. Like I could have done other things like you could imagine randomly scrambling a puzzle, except for many of the puzzles that wouldn't work. Um, the puzzle wouldn't be as good because they're hand designed to contain certain ideas. You could somehow substitute out a different puzzle that has the same idea, that would be tremendously hard to design and I wouldn't have finished the game, honestly, if I tried to do that. Um, you could like just time out the panel and have it come back on later. That would be approximately as frustrating. In fact, it might be more frustrating because then you have to wait. There's no deliberate action you can take to make the panel come on. Whereas in the way it is now, you at least know what you can go do to go ahead again. So. That's all. I mean, it's, it's really to, it, it's exactly, it's to punish guessing, really, to put it very straightforwardly. Um, and that's, it's not that fun to be punished for guessing. But like I said, not everything in the game is fun, so. So there is a point that I, I, I'm curious about knowing when you, you started jumping with the, um, with the characters and they just keep moving with you, there is some point that you cannot go further because they block your way and so on. Mm -hmm. When you design that, do you know all the outcomes? I mean, so you know every stage where the character can actually go and do because, for example, I, at one point I jumped down and they keep moving. Yeah. So then I thought, okay, if I jump, if I, if I jump, if I jump uh, further, they are going to move a little bit more. So then, is the outcome is going to be the outcome you want it to happen the same, or like, do you think on all the outcome that can happen? You, like, like that? So the way that world works makes it simpler than you might think because the way it works is that what time it is depends on your horizontal position in the level and only that, right? So at a specific time. Um, assuming you haven't interfered with anything, like if you haven't jumped on any of the monsters or whatever, then at a certain time, that monster will always be at a certain position, right? Um, and then I just have to think in that very constrained way. So when it comes to, oh, I'm trying to climb up this ladder, but somehow the monster happens to be in exactly the right place to block me, well, you just, you know what time it has to be there, and that tells you what time it has to come out of the little cannon or whatever. Um, So it really was not as hard to do as you might think. Yeah. <laughs>
You could try it some, you just design on a piece of paper, try to design that, and it's actually, uh, it's probably not hard. Uh, talking about inventing your own customized wheels. Yeah. Uh, very, very often people are very proud of, of what they develop, a uh, piece of code they write, and are not willing to dump them again. So uh, a lot of code, a lot of bad code survives from one project to the other. Yep. Uh, and I guess you keep code and, and throw away code. How afraid are you of, of throwing away a good, a possibly a working piece of code? It depends on how big it is and on how hard it is to recreate. But actually, to do a really good job on things, I think you have to throw things away a couple of times, especially if they're important. Um, and so, you know, I said before that I started a game company at the worst possible time. And one of the things that made that time hard was that that was when games started going 3D and becoming very complicated and requiring high budgets. And the other reason was just, it was also the time at which the idea of what games were trying to be outpaced the actual computers that we had by the most. And so computers were really slow compared to what you had to work really hard to get a game to even, you know, like I was happy to get eight frames per second, you know, um, not super happy, but like that was, that was all right. Um, and, and so the thing was that computers were changing enough, you know, we started on a 486 and then we got a Pentium and so forth. And, those machines have very different properties about what is fast. Um, and so what, and also we were learning how to write 3D engines. So um, I probably had to write the core rendering of that particular game that I'm thinking of at least eight times, possibly more. And that's just the core, like drawing the pixels on the screen. There's other stuff that had to be rewritten several times, like landscape rendering and stuff. So, um, I guess I got used to the idea that I'm I'm not doing one and done, right? I'm really uh, redoing things until they're good. And even when things are not as hard as, as they were then, it's a very good idea to do that because if you don't do that, whatever you do first is going to have some problems or some inadequacies, right? Things that are not as good as they should be. And then everything that you build on top of that assumes those problems or has to work around those problems, right? And then maybe sometimes it happens that because you're working around those problems, now you have a problem, your outer layer has a problem and it has to do things. And then the next layer has to deal with that and it propagates upward and everything gets worse. And when you look like at something like the modern worldwide web and how your web pages don't really work consistently when you just go to a simple website and try to do something. Um, it's because of that. It's because the foundations are very weak and every layer that gets put around those foundations is correspondingly uh, not solid. Um, if you could erase the whole web, I mean, maybe translate all the sites, not destroy people's work, but if you could just rebuild the web from a from a solid foundation that, by the way, we knew how to do in the 1990s. It's just people just didn't decide to do it that way, right? Um, <laughs> if you went back and did it that way, things would be tremendously better. Websites would be faster. Uh, machine rooms would use much less electricity, right? All sorts of things would happen. All for a couple of, just a couple of bad decisions that were made in like 1995 or 94 or something like that. Um, so it's important, it's important to revise. And, and again, bringing it back to the computer science knowledge to know what you should be able to do so that you know if you're very far off target. Um, but I understand, I understand that feeling that people have. They feel like, oh, it was so hard to get to this that I can't throw it away or something. And lesson one is actually, it's not gonna be that hard to get there again because you already did it and you're better now, and you're better at this specific problem now, first of all. Um, secondly, if you're putting this out into the world, I mean, if you talk about people putting things on GitHub or something, um, other people's impression of you is <laughs> depends on, on what you put out there. And if you put out things that are kind of cruddy and that you can't really run without doing this and that, uh, 
it looks less good. So for those people who are asking, is it intimidating to follow up a success or something, then apply that reasoning to whether you should clean up your code and rewrite it before you put it out in the world. And then there's the whole, there's the, so the same thing I said about the web, how it multiplied and became incredibly worse is true about any open source software in a different direction as well. So there's the building on it direction, but there's also just the multiplicity. So if, suppose you're making something that's not even meant to be built on, it's just a program, end user program that people can run. Mm -hmm. And let's say it crashes 5% of the time losing some work, or it takes 30 seconds to start up when it should be instant. And you're like, oh, I could fix that, but I don't exactly know how right now, and it might take me two weeks to figure it out, and I don't want to because I'm busy or I have to go do schoolwork and I'm being responsible or whatever, okay? It may even be the right decision in, that, in, in terms of your own life, but it has consequences. So if you put this thing out in the world and it becomes even mildly popular and 10,000 people use it, that's a not that popular piece of software, okay? Then take your five minute crashes or 5% of the time crashes and multiply those by 10,000, right? Estimate how much time is wasted for one person Say one person runs that 30 second startup 10 times, right? That's five minutes wasted times 10,000 people. That's 50,000 minutes, which is, you know, something like a thousand hours of time. It's a little bit less than that. So um, it, it would have cost you less than a thousand hours of time to fix that, a lot less. So what you've done is you've, it's the same thing as like industries polluting the environment. You've exported a negative externality into the world through your software, right? You've made other people's lives worse because you didn't want to spend the time making your thing better. And I wish computer science schools would teach that because that's actually one of the dominant, so you kind of wonder like, oh, you know, Linux has, it's been the year of the Linux desktop every year since for 20 years, right? Why doesn't it get good enough to take over? And it's like, well, just look at the kind of experience you have when you try to use open source software. It wastes, you can get it working eventually, but it wastes a certain amount of your time. What if every person who uses open source had all that time back, 99% of it or whatever, right? And could have used that instead to push things forward. I think you'd be looking at a different story. So that's enough to say on that. Are we getting kicked out? Is, are we out of time? Um, you want to? I could go more if we want. I'm just conscious that people have been here a long time. And do, do we still have questions either on Twitch or... Uh, if you feel like or... leaving the room, that's fine too. <laughs> you know, you don't have to sit here forever. So, um, you're constantly talking about wasting time. Sure. So, I want to know if you sometimes think that people who are playing games are wasting their time. Maybe they could use it for creating something like you are creating games. <laughs> so I just, I just want, I would like to know your opinion about that. The, the answer to this, <laughs> the answer to this is very complex, right? Um, there's a lot of different reasons that you might play games, um, but you can get a little bit of a clue from the kind of game, right? Some games are really maybe made to waste time, right? So some of these games on your phone are just... Well, let's talk for a second about some of the things that you might get that maybe aren't a waste of time somehow. Maybe a game has a really good story that you like and you're getting a story and, and that's a positive thing. It's like, okay, there's that, but, but really, I mean, I've always felt that if you want a good story, well, first of all, we have the medium of literature that people have been working on for 2,000 years or more, and the stories there are actually pretty good. And a lot of the time, though, that's not what people want. They want the, you know, uh, trying to think of a really bad story. They want the Da Vinci Code or something, right? So they're not... Um, it's not really a good story that they want, but it's, well, maybe what they mean by the good story is different. They want a little bit of suspense and then relief of the suspense and then suspense and the relief of the suspense, which is fine, but if you, this is going really deep into one arm of this, but, but then 
the books that try to do that are a lot like the games we were talking about, where they're industrial products, essentially, trying to create a, one certain thing. And then all those books end up sort of being the same book. Like, you're getting the same thing out of, if you read 10 of those, you're getting the same thing as the first one. So maybe at some point, you maybe should have had enough of that. Maybe it's after 10, maybe it's after 50, but at some point, why read the same? Actually, you know, all these superhero movies that are coming out are basically the same movie. They've got mildly different characters and uh, a plot that n is not at all meaningful to any real human being, right? Like, I don't think I'm going to need to save the universe from a monster from beyond time and space where, like, that could be really cool, something beyond time and space, but actually it's a really giant guy that lives out in space. <laughs> um, maybe some people know what movie I'm talking about. That's just one example, but these are all the same, they're all the same movie. And, and so when people go to see 17 of those, it's maybe a sign that they're not trying to move forward in some way, right? Um, so you can apply that to games. I think it's easier to see in movies because um, it's easier for me to see in movies, maybe not for everybody. Um, but, but so then you look at games on the phone and all that, and they have more, they're more different in form, I guess. So you have the game about building the high rise and the little characters walk around and it makes you wait unless you pay the microtransaction. And it's only about making progress up through the things, or you have the game about running the farm and it's only about making the progress up through what can be on the farm. And they're the same game. They're just different enough to fool you for a second into starting to play it. But then what they're actually about is the same. It's just about, you wasting time to get higher numbers, right? Um, and when you look at it that way, most games on the phone are that game. So I have a very negative view toward that kind of thing. And if somebody spends a great deal of time playing those, uh, I, f I doubt that they're really getting something out of it, right? Um, now, a little bit of time playing those, I think, is a genuinely new experience. Like, oh, you know, the first one, oh, I'm running my farm, and oh, isn't it cool that I have my farm and my friends can look at it and whatever. And then the second one of those, it's like, oh, I'm, I've got my little hotel, and I'm making the hotel nice, and the rooms are better decorated, and isn't that cool? And I see, I maybe see how that's a little bit like the farm, but it's also different, and that's interesting. But after like number seven, or, or after you've played one of those for many, many hours, it's, there's not anything there anymore. And so I think then, if there's a whole industry based on the idea that you can take that same thing and just change the colors, um, I think that runs out eventually. That industry is creatively starved very quickly. Um, but there are other things in games that I think are very deep and are very worth understanding. You know, I mentioned one earlier, like uh, playing Opus Magnum. There's a kind of realization that I can see about, <laughs> it's a very abstract realization, but it's something about uh, how little machines work or like how the patterns of, how you can be tricky to do something that in a very non-obvious way, I, there's just feelings that you get that you can take into life from there. and. Maybe most of the time they won't directly apply to any situation, but they may a little bit, and and they may also be formative on the personality, you know. Um, so there are things like that in games that have to do with what you're really doing in the game. If you can look at what you're really doing in the game and see something productive about that or see something creative about that, then maybe it's not so bad to spend a lot of time in that, you know. And my views on this tend to be a little bit different from what people expect. So one thing that people think about, so, so phone games are not necessarily too violent, but like games on consoles and PCs are often, I'm gonna go kill a bunch of guys or I'm gonna beat them up or something. And um, the, that negative aspect, when people think about games being bad, that actually gets most of the attention, at least in the US and I don't know, it's probably not so different here. Um, and I don't think that's good. But also often the deeper things that the game is about are better than that. 
and it's a little bit sad that they have to be in the venue of shooting people, but at least it works to get you to those deeper things. So like a, a game like Counter-Strike, for example, um, I think has a lot of redeeming value because it's, it's about being perceptive and uh, understanding what's happening at like five different places in this big environment and using your eyes and using your ears and making plans with very little time and then executing them. And one of the things that makes it good is it's multiplayer. So if you're playing against people and you can win, that means you're really good and you've really developed some skills. Now, again, some of those skills don't really translate into the world, but a, a lot of them will. Um, uh, to, a more trendy example is Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, right? Which is, um, again, has many of those properties, except even amped up even more. In that game, it's, it's a little bit crazy how perceptive you have to be, and that's a positive thing. Um, it is a, a military fantasy, which again, I think is a little bit of a negative thing, because we, we don't really need more of those. Um, but uh, it actually gets rid of, both Counter-Strike and that game get rid of what I think is the most negative part of all these military fantasies and the most psychologically destructive part, which is what you see in like the single player ones like Call of Duty and stuff, which is just, this game is this fantasy about how I can be, I can be an army guy with a gun and I can just kill all the bad guys. It was the same fantasy in these movies, by the way, right? I can just defeat all the bad guys and I'm better than like hundreds of them and their lives don't matter and I'm just gonna run, run around winning because I deserve to win because I'm me, right? That's what most of these single player games say. And the nice thing about the multiplayer games is they get rid of all of that because if you're there being an army guy with a gun, there's somebody else there being an army guy with a gun and you actually learn something from that. You learn how not easy it is to defeat even one person, right? Much less uh, hundreds or thousands. And it's a real person and all that comes into play. So it's not obvious what's good and what's bad, I think. And many games have both. And um, I, don't, I don't like violent games so much. But what is more insidious to me, or more destructive even, is the, the kind of psychological manipulation games, which is actually now in both of these. So now you have Call of Duty with the endless character upgrading that tries to keep you playing forever, and the violence. So that's maybe worse than anything else. But even just like Farmville or something, where it's a, it, that game is, those games are a trap, right? They're a trap where they try to get you to notice them being a shiny thing on your phone, and then they just try to keep you there. Facebook is the same thing, but if you go outside of games, right? They're all just designed to keep you there, and that is very negative. So yes, if you're caught in one of those traps, or anyone you know is caught in one of those traps, you might do well to maybe try to get them out somehow. Um, uh, but definitely, Certainly, I believe there are very deep things in games that are very well worth experiencing, or I would not be spending my entire life working on those things. So I guess that was a long answer, but hopefully it answers the question. One last question. One last question. Yeah. All right. I hope this is a really good question, man. It's the last one. No pressure. Uh, there's a microphone being passed, or oh no, did you give it to someone else? <laughs> we'll do two last questions. It's fine. Well, you were talking about uh, yeah. how easy game dev is nowadays compared to the 80s and 90s. Yeah. So I was wondering, what's your uh, personal view on frameworks like uh, Unreal Engine and Unity? Oh, I could talk about that for a long time, but I won't. Um, <laughs> So my view is if you're someone in school like this or you're getting started, it's a good idea to use one of those because it'll get you going faster and you'll have a game that you can play with and, you know, the, but because when you're new, your ideas do not match reality very well. It's always the case. So the sooner you can make it into a reality, you can see what's actually going to happen when you build this game and you can modify it and, and change it, right? So things like Unity and Unreal are good for that. Um, however, <laughs> you pay for that later. So if you're trying to make things that are bigger or more subtle or where you need a great deal of control over what happens, 
you lose the ability to do that very effectively, right? Um, the way, it, the analogy doesn't exactly fit, but I, I think of them as like power tools. So like I have a cordless drill that I can drill really fast holes with, or I have like a jackhammer that'll break up walls. But if I need like a scalpel to cut out a really nice exact shape and my design won't work if that shape isn't right, it becomes very hard to do that in those engines. It still may be possible, but very difficult. But you probably don't need a scalpel until later when you're much more experienced, right? So what I tell people these days, and they don't like to hear this actually, maybe, maybe since I'm in a computer science place, it's people are more receptive to this, but um, I say, go ahead and get started on those. But then if you're starting a company or something, have a plan to get off it eventually. And that might be, first game, we're just using Unity, getting used to Unity. Second game, we're going to write a subsystem that does something interesting. Like, we're going to write our own, maybe we're doing something stylized where all the characters are made out of particles or something. Once in a while, there's a game. So we want a very specific particle system. We might start prototyping in Unity, but we're going to write our own that does exactly what we want and is very, very fast. And that lets us do something much more than we could do if we use a generic system. And it gives us more control over exactly what things look like and so forth, right? And then maybe the next game, you could be like, oh, um, I mean, character animation is a little ambitious, but like, let's write the character animation because we want it to do a certain thing that it doesn't do. Um, so piece by piece, you could build facility at creating a game engine without ever having the big problem that people often have, which is just they start writing a game engine. It's a harder problem than they ever expected, which it is guaranteed, even if you expect it to be hard. Um, and then they just never get to make the game because they never finished the engine, right? That's actually, that used to happen all the time in the 90s and early 2000s before there were things like Unity and Unreal. Um, so you want to avoid that problem, but you don't, you don't want to become a second class developer where second, that's just a term that I, that's not an official term, but like if you are not in control of your own ability if you're not in control of exactly what you are able to build, then you'll never be able to reach places that some other developers who can do that will be able to go, right? And long-term, you want to avoid that. But initially, it's not important. So, all right. Did we want to get this one guy over there? Short answer for your short question. <laughs> I just felt bad because I, I pointed at him and the microphone had already gone to someone else. Yeah. Uh, okay, so my question is very related to this one. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you what you think about the future of gaming giants. Do you think that it will be, yeah, like 20 years ago, you probably would need to program your own gaming giant. Yeah, it was a really hard process. Right now it's yeah. more simplified. Yeah. And I think maybe in the future, do you think it will be like a drag and drop objects and you don't will be you don't need so much programming and no, I mean simplified. Here's the thing. Like a programming and the modeling, everything will be I don't know. I mean well we have that already. We have drag and drop things. Yeah, 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 and they're yeah, not but very I mean it will be more simplified like a Generating modeling from the creation. I mean, so I think if you go far enough into the future, nobody can predict, right? So I'm not going to try and predict the far future, but for the nearer future, like let's say the next 10 years, um, I don't think so. And the reason is because with any kind of tool like that, all you can really do is adjust things that are cosmetic, right? Just visual or something. Like maybe I have my Farmville game and I'm going to change it into the um, Farmville Arctic, right? And, or, uh, you know, maybe I change it into a game about, um, I don't know, managing a castle instead of a farm. And I managed to change some of the rules a little bit because whatever this, you know, like Unreal Blueprints or something gives me some boxes and I can put lines between the boxes and I can make some things that are a little bit algorithmic with that, right? There's two problems. Uh, well, there's, only, there's really one basic problem, which is that what makes game interesting, what makes games interesting broadly is behavior. It's creating interesting systemic behavior that people can partake in. And 
If you just replicate a simple behavior from some other game, you're basically that game. So you need interesting behavior. Interesting behavior is algorithms. Algorithms are programs. So really what you're asking is, can a non-programmer use some visual tools to create sophisticated behavior? And I think the answer is not anytime soon, um, unless they really program. So, um, you know, even something like Unreal Blueprints, you know, you can basically do like the modern version of a flowchart of a program and you try to run that and it doesn't exactly do what people want it to and it's tremendously slower than if you had just written some code, which means it won't scale very far and it won't run in limited environments very well. Um, and so then you need a programmer to show up and rewrite it. And you also just don't have access to deep things. So with a computer science education, you understand some things about algorithms and you know what they look like deep down and, and what sorts of things are possible. And somebody who just shows up and tries to connect lines and boxes or whatever, imagine like a VR version of that with like spatial whatever. If you don't understand that kind of thing, you're not going to be able to do it that well, I don't think so. But I can be wrong, you know, who knows. If that's, if that's your, an area that you're excited about, I wouldn't discourage you from working in it, for example, but um, it's not what I would choose to work in. Maybe partially because I just already have enough to do. All right, thank you, everybody, for sitting here so long. Thank you for having me. It's been thank good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming here. It was a pleasure having you here, uh -huh. coming all the way from Seattle and being very tired, probably. <laughs> so let's thank Jonathan. Uh -huh.